Welcome. I had a particular moment in my life. Of course, life is nothing but moments. But one particular moment stood out for me that I just wanted to share as a kind of an opener for this particular talk. It was a moment when I sat at my desk in my office as uh, at that time as uh, president of Kripalu Center. And I had just given notice and worked things out with the board that I was going to be uh, stepping down. I was going to support the transition, find a new CEO, and, uh, and then be on my way. I was a little bit of a backstory. Previous to that, I had spent 24 years uh, deeply associated with the organization. I, I kind of stumbled in when I was 25, I think, 26 years old, and uh, threw myself into the community. And over those 24 years, I had a I had a celibacy vow, I had a poverty vow, I had, had an arranged marriage. Um, I worked six and a half days a week um, and tremendously excited about, um, about my life, about my, my inner life with my practices, and also being a force for what I thought was good in the world. I, I gave myself completely to the organization. And over those years, I was one of the, one of the main teachers and uh, been a spokesperson, done PR, marketing, fundraising, um, leading retreats, you know, the whole, the whole shebang totally identified with the place. And, and here I was moving on. After you've been president of an organization, um, you got to go. <laughs> Part of my realization was that I'm not a natural administrator. Um, there was a very, very strong need to fill some gaps. And I stepped in there for, uh, for a while. We had some tremendous challenges. And I was really kind of a, a long, at the end of a long line of CEOs who completely burned themselves out trying to run this crazy nonprofit. And I have to admit, in those moments, I was panicking. I had no idea what was next. From a very, very young age, 26 years old, right after I finished my, my time in the Peace Corps, I, this was where I grew up. And a question popped into my mind as I was sort of going through my, my little panic here. And of course, I'd come up with all these different scenarios of what I might do, where I might live, and none of them resonated yet. So really hanging out in the void. And I wondered if I had, if I had made, made a mistake. The question was this. What if you look back in two years and realize this is one of the best things that ever happened to you? That question gave me a lot of comfort. And it wasn't two years. It was less than that. <laughs> when I realized, wow, this was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Shifting my relationship to that problem, if you will, was really quite dramatic. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that, but I'd like to share first pretty much the punchline of this talk. So um, once you get the punchline, you can sign off. You don't have to listen to the rest. But it's a quote I'd like to share from Eckhart Tolle. He says this. He says, narrow your life down to this moment. Narrow your life down to this moment. Your life situation may be full of problems. Most life situations are. But find out if you have a problem at this moment. Do you have a problem now? Again, that's pretty much the punchline. So um, if you do want to stay on, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature of the moment and the nature of problems and the nature of the self. Specifically, I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of equanimity. Equanimity is one of these exalted qualities, kind of the fruit of practice. It's the sense of steadiness in the midst of change. I'd like to talk about the power of adjusting your attitude as problems arise. And to touch into the root 
of our problem with problems. And finally, talk a little bit about the nature of the nature of the self. That is to say, like, where is the self who actually has a problem? There's a classic story um, that's been used way too many times in, uh, in Dharma talks, but I'll just mention it anyway. <laughs> you may know the story of this farmer who wakes up one morning and he sees that three wild horses have just come into his corral. His neighbors say, wow, what good fortune. And he says, well, good news, bad news, who knows? His son, who's a robust young man, is trying to break the horses and he's thrown from one of the horses and he breaks his leg. His neighbors say, what terrible fortune. And the farmer says, well, good news, bad news, who knows? A little bit later, the army comes through conscripting young men for a big battle, and they, they pass by his son because of his broken leg. Good news, bad news, who knows? As I've been thinking about an updated version of that story, um, as, as we all know, there was a leak that just came out from the Supreme Court indicating that the Supreme Court is going to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, depending on your point of view, good news, bad news, who knows? From the standpoint of those who want to preserve a woman's right to choose, it sure looks like bad news. On the other hand, perhaps this is a wake-up call. As these rights have been sort of taken for, taken for granted, Perhaps there'll be some kind of mobilization. Perhaps this will bring in more fundraising for progressive candidates. Perhaps this will change the outcome of the midterm elections. What if we could remember this? Good news, bad news, who knows? I was reminiscing with a friend recently about um, a biking adventure that I, that I took. <laughs> Living in West Africa, I, I, I met someone who had crossed the Sahara Desert from the north to the south. He stayed with me. Uh, he told me about it, all how to do it. And I got very, very psyched. I was living in, in uh, Niamey in, in Niger, right in the kind of the, the Sahel, which is a little bit south of the Sahara. And I got very, very excited about it. And I, I trained for it and uh, I took off. I did a little, a short, a short trip to kind of uh, work out the kinks and essentially starting off on my trip and, and uh, I got very sick. Uh, the, there was a hot season happening. It was terrible. The Harmaton winds, dust laden winds. I got these um, epic nosebleeds from all the dust getting in my sinuses and breathing all that dust. And, and when I got really, really sick and I got a ride back to, the, um, to where he started in the capital city, Good news, bad news, who knows? Perhaps it was really good news that I got sick early. What if I had gotten sick in the middle of nowhere? So again, it's a fascinating thing. If you think about a problem, let's say you, just, you might want to take a moment. Is there something problematic in your life right now? Just out of, out of all of them, can you just pick one for a moment? When you think about how long you've been tolerating this issue, you might ask yourself, in fact, let's just take a moment to kind of, if you want to amplify the problem, just kind of ask yourself, so all right, what is this like at its worst? When it's really chronic, what's that problem like? And then you might ask a couple of questions, the what if questions. What if this could be a turning point in your life? What if this problem is the motivation you need to make some change? What if this is a teacher calling for your attention? Our attitude around problems 
is malleable. We, we actually have some control over that. As the saying goes, it's not necessarily what's happening, it's how you're relating to it becomes an interesting question. And there's a possibility that, that problems have an, they all, all have an element of pain and there's a brilliant function of pain. Pain is a way of bringing your attention to something. And this is where problems, stress, suffering, pain, become an opportunity. When there's a crisis, there's, there's more awareness about it. There's more consciousness about it. And sometimes more of a willingness to embrace change and adapt. Generally, people, people are generally indifferent. But when there's a crisis, they're more open to interventions. And we, see, we can see this when we look at politics, that there's an issue that's kind of been under the surface and festering for a really long time, and then it blows up as a crisis, and then suddenly there's motivation to put in legislation to deal with it. And an interesting example, you might recall the Deepwater Horizon crisis in 2010. An oil rig exploded and collapsed right in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. 87 days of uncontrolled release of crude oil. There was no technology to contain it. Serious crisis. And what came out of that was a new technology that was completely developed on the fly over just a few months. It's called the, the, the capping stick. And with this new technology that was had to happen with all kinds of innovation, experimentation, and intensity, that they came up with this protocol for, for capping a deep water well that's now a new protocol. And with that new protocol, there is a very, very good chance that that, may can, that can be corrected in the future. And also, because of that crisis, there's a lot more resiliency for the next event. A lot of what happens, and particularly happened here, is that when there's a crisis, it forces a new level of cooperation among rivals. So all of the oil companies were working together to figure out how to fix this. They developed systemic change. They developed dramatic policy shifts. And what comes out of crisis sometimes are the people who really step up to, to respond to that crisis. So the question becomes, or one of the questions is, what does it take for us to wake up? We end up tolerating a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort because it hasn't reached that threshold where we say, I've had it, this is enough. And, you know, I, I mentioned this a, a while back, but it's a, it's a fascinating exercise. When I owned my own home way, way back when, I, I just had a general sense of malaise. I just sort of didn't like my, my house. I didn't like my life. <laughs> and I ran across this thing called making your toleration list. And what you do is you write down everything you're putting up with. And I realized I was overrun by this like death by a thousand cuts. All these little things that I was just putting up with. And the idea of the toleration list, if you're inspired to try it, is get out a clipboard and write down everything you're putting up with, everything you're tolerating. So I went through every room of my house and I made notes. The screen door that squeaks every time I use it, the the closet I tell myself I need to clean out every time I walk by it. On and on and on. I think I had like 50 or 60 of these little niggly things that I was tolerating. And then I took one weekend and kind of like full time, I just started banging stuff out. And I can't just, I, I just can't fully describe how amazing it felt to take the time to turn my attention to all these little things I was putting up with. Every time after that, when the screen door would close quietly, there'd be this little rush of happiness. <laughs> I then instituted something that I call my weekly review, which I've been doing for many, many years, where I, 
I go through all of my projects. And the most important thing I get out of this is I, I decide what I'm not going to do. I basically make a decision I'm not going to do it. So if I decide I'm not going to clean out that closet, I, I walk by, I walk by that closet, it's not a problem because I've made a choice that I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to fix it up. So essentially, in an unexamined life, you're not aware of everything you're putting up with. And the outcome can be kind of this general sense of malaise, a general sense of overwhelm. And one of the things about mindfulness, of course, is we become more aware. We become more aware of what's bugging us, as well as more aware of what gives us joy. And we become more aware of what we're tolerating. And you become more aware of what's under your control and what's not under your control, which is huge. So an interesting study, I was reading this in the Harvard Business Review. They're looking at engineering students. Engineering students are all about solving problems. They have to understand the scope of the problem, generate ideas, evaluate the ideas, come up with solutions. And there are two kinds of thinking. One of them is convergent thinking. And this is linear thinking. Okay, if we want to get it done, here are the steps that we need to follow. A and then B and then C and then D. Another quality of thinking is what's called divergent thinking. And this is basically, think of this as brainstorming. It's generating all kinds of possible solutions. And what they find is that when it comes to problem solving, both are really important. But divergent thinking is particularly important if you want to innovate, if you want to innovate. And it's really what you're doing here, and I find this so interesting, Harvard Business Review, it's training yourself how to defer judgment and how to be courageous. It's training yourself to be more present in the moment, to relax, and to reach a mode of acceptance. Now, what's so fascinating here is convergent thinking is wonderful. It's linear, linear thinking. But training yourself to become more fluid and divergent thinking requires these qualities. Deferring judgment, being curious, being present, relaxing, accepting. So what they've discovered is a causal link between mindfulness and divergent thinking. Or we could call it beginner's mind. As Shunryo Suzuki said many, many years ago, in the, in the expert's mind, there are very few possibilities. In the beginner's mind, infinite possibilities. So mindfulness, this capacity to relax, to defer judgment, to be present, to, to, be, to be open and accepting is a powerful catalyst for innovation. There's some really, really interesting studies. And I find it really curious how, again, when it comes to problematic situations, as I mentioned before, I was involved with John Hopkins with their exploration of high dose psilocybin with long term meditators. Uh, I kind of I went through the protocol and kind of helped to, to kind of talk about how the protocol would be effective for that particular population. And one of the things when you when you go through the orientation around high dose psilocybin is what happens when you hit difficulty. And essentially, what they say is if something difficult arises, turn toward it. See it as a teacher. It's helpful if you're doing high-dose psilocybin. <laughs> it's also helpful in the rest of your life. So another study that was generated was a professor who, who noticed after she did some Zen training 
that she noticed that she had some kind of improved skills in in kind of conceptual modeling and so forth. Again, back to engineering, which is a very interesting model because engineering is all about convergent thinking. We think, but we're realizing hmm, divergence really important too. So she developed this group, two groups, experimental and control. The first group, um, well, first she did she did this three times, four weeks and then six weeks. And they meditated for 12 minutes a day, 10 to 12 minutes a day. And the technique they did was the body scan and concentration on breath. And afterward, they did these conceptual modeling exercises, analytical skills, reading comprehension, classifying and organizing concepts. And they measured effectiveness and efficiency. What they found was the meditators were significantly more effective, 10% more effective and more efficient, 37 to 46% more efficient. This is from 12 minutes a day, of body scan and focusing on an anchor, calming and seeing more clearly. And this to me, I just find so fascinating when it comes to working through life's difficulties and working through life's problems. Your capacity for convergent and divergent thinking become enhanced. And now the interesting thing is, what do you see when you're, when you're seeing more clearly? What is it that we actually see? Well, one of the things that you see is this play of attachment and letting go, of clinging and release. When I go back to my anxiety, uh, letting go of my whole sense of who I was as president of this organization, I realized to my, for myself that I was, uh, there were a number of things I was attached to. I was attached to the story of who I was in this role and what that meant. I was attached to the security of it, the, the financial security it was really, really nice. And I was really just attached to this whole identity uh, that I had developed over all these years. And I was really not looking forward to letting it all go. What was helpful for me though, was really pausing and just asking, what am I holding on to? What am I clinging to? And this of course is, it's the nub, it's the nub of it, it's the key. So you might take a moment and reflect on something challenging in your life right now. Let's do this as a short little meditation. If, if you're up for it, you can close your eyes, maybe take three breaths. And you might think of something, something for you has some kind of inherent dissatisfaction. Something you're just not happy with. Something that's between you and feeling free. And take a moment just to sense what it's like inside when you think about it. Is there a sense of, of how this issue is kind of living in your nervous system? And you might just ask yourself, what are you holding on to? What are you hoping for here that's not happening? Where is the clinging? Where is the attachment? And if you would just take a few moments and sense what it's like to hold on, what it's like to cling. And you might ask yourself now, Could you let it go? 
If you could let it go, would you? And can you imagine what it would feel like if you could let it go just a little bit? And if you like, you can deepen your breath. And if you like, you can open your eyes or remain with them closed. This is really, this points toward the essence of the practice. And one of the beautiful things about the, the Buddhist teachings on, on the Four Noble Truths or the Four Essential Principles of the practice is recognizing that stress, dissatisfaction, unsteadiness is part of life. It happens. The second is realizing that there's a, there's a cause, and the cause has to do with this clinging, with this identification, attachment. The third is the recognition that you can let go. And the fourth is realizing that there's, that there's a path, that there, there are technologies, there are teachings, there are practices that will support you more and more and more in letting go. What I find really interesting is that, that some people tend to put most of their attention on the first two, that there's stress and suffering and there's a cause. Some people focus on more on the second two. You can let go and there's a path of letting go. And we've got to find our balance in there because sometimes just focusing on the first two gets a little grim. And just focusing on the second two is leads to kind of spiritual bypassing and tre premature transcendence. But seeing the attachment and clinging, so, so important. Sometimes it's really gross attachment. I don't want to share my ice cream cone with you. <laughs> Sometimes it's very, very subtle. And that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit, the subtlety of attachment and clinging. It has to do with the sense of I and mine. And this leads to a somewhat esoteric inquiry. It kind of leads a little bit toward the, um, the element of premature transcendence, but it's a very, very powerful reframe. There are lots of uh, someone goes to a guru stories out there. I'll tell you one that I ran across. This guy goes to a guru. Guru says, I'm so glad you found me. I'll, you can ask me one question and I will respond as best as I can. A fellow says, well, I have this one question that has been plaguing me ever since I took a math class when I was 13. If a train is traveling 70 miles per hour, it leaves from Atlanta at 7 p.m., and another train leaves from Kansas City at 9.45 p.m. <laughs> okay. Here's the other one. This one's pretty interesting. This guy goes to a guru, and he's complaining. He's complaining about his family and how they don't listen to him. He's complaining about his job, how it's not really satisfying how he's been passed over and not acknowledged. He's complaining about the lack of, lack of savings for, for his old age. He's complaining about this issue with his low back and how his feet ache and his digestion isn't so strong. He says, what do I do with all these problems? And the guru says, these are a lot of problems. Now tell me, where is the one who has this problem? Now, what this points toward is the nature of the self. So I'd like to offer just a short inquiry once again. If you like, you can close your eyes. You might slow down your breath. 
And as you just sense this body from the inside, you might ask yourself the following question. Where is awareness? Can you, can you locate it? Where is this self? You might deepen your breath a bit. If you like, you can open your eyes. Now that, that question, that question can be really enervating. <laughs> but it becomes a very interesting inquiry. What, where is the self? Where is awareness? Internal family systems is an incredibly powerful thing to explore. And it identifies some of the, the parts inside that we're, we're kind of a breakdown of all these different submodalities. There's the child, the parent, the complainer, the controller, the rescuer, the striver, the spiritual warrior, all these different components of, of, of this self. But the self itself <laughs> can be broken down into two components. One is the, the self that is the result of causes and conditions. That includes your physical body. It includes your psychology, the imprint from your primary caretakers, from your life experiences, from all these different elements that, that tend to dominate at different times. The controller, you know, the rescuer, the spiritual warrior, all these different components come to the foreground. And yet there's something that is aware of all these parts. There's something about the self that is unconditioned. So we have the conditioned self and the unconditioned self. What happens most of the time is we're identified with that conditioned self. We're identified with the one who's wronged. We're identified with the one who's striving. We're identified with the one who is trying to dominate or we're identified with the one who's trying to avoid domination from others. That idea of can you find the one or can you find the self that has a problem becomes a very interesting way of kind of like fracturing this world of, of, of the conditioned self. What, what tends to happen is that when we focus on our problems, they, they pull us in and they make us small. When we can ask these questions such as, what if, when I look back, this will be one of the best things that ever happened? What if this is a, a teacher here to unveil some new possibilities to me? What if this is a reminder that I can open more, open the frame of my awareness to look for the good? Then we are dramatically deconstructing these, these problems, if you will. Someone said that most of the problems in, problems in life are because of two reasons. We act without thinking, or we keep thinking without acting. And the challenge and the invitation is to pause, to deeply, deeply slow down, and to look at our life from a wider, a wider view.
It's a story of a guy who's really frustrated working on his computer, and it was a cold winter's morning, and he texted his wife saying, the window's frozen, won't open. She texts back and says, well, gently pour some lukewarm water over it and gently tap the edges with a hammer. Five minutes later, he says the computer's really messed up now. We have to, we have to shift our consciousness in order to solve our problems. So let's close with a short meditation. And we'll kind of explore this in a little bit of a review. As you close your eyes, you might think about this, who you are as the conditioned self, all the different influences in your life, all of your preferences, all of your aversions, navigating this world of duality with all of its challenges. And you might reflect on how the mind has this tendency to anticipate problems and to review problems. And if you would, slow down your breath and reflect on, again, this quote from Eckhart Tolle. Narrow your life down to this moment. Your life situation may be full of problems. Most life situations are, but find out if you have a problem at this moment. Do you have a problem now? And in these final moments, you might take a moment to kind of reflect on this question of where is awareness? Can you locate it? Can you sense the the play of the conditioned self? Acknowledging everything in your experience that's a product of causes and conditions. And can you imagine if for a moment the unconditioned self, oh, unconditioned awareness? Acknowledging your capacity for convergent thinking. For, for linear thinking and your capacity for divergent thinking, for opening to infinite possibilities. And can you sense the balance? Awareness wide open and at the same time here and now. You might take a moment to reflect on the following question before we close. What is the most important thing in your life right now? And can you imagine this most important thing, more fully alive, more fully expressed. Can you imagine this most important thing being cultivated through your capacity to access non-judging awareness? 
Can you imagine it being nurtured by curiosity through acceptance? Through this quality of beginner's mind, as well as your capacity to execute things in real world time. As you're ready, you can gently deepen your breath. As you're ready, you can deepen your breath. I hope this is helpful as we explore the challenges of life. I just find it so critical to remember that we have this quality of steadiness that's available to us. That one thing we do have control over is our attitude, our capacity to look at, at the root of attachment and clinging and to let go and to open to this mystery of accessing unconditioned awareness as a tool for moving toward what's most important. May you and your divergent and convergent thinking have a wonderful experience together. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Take good care.